What's going on, you guys? I'm Ronnie. This is Amanda. And this is Ground Ground Zero. Zero. Welcome to Ground Zero. week um originally we were already supposed to have this episode up but uh work kind of got ahead of us and our schedules changed around yeah so we're kind of running behind but well now we're getting back into it so tonight's episode we're going to be talking about witchcraft in tennessee mm-hmm. we got a couple of stories and uh some of you that might not know Um, There's the famous Bell Witch story that we're going to talk about, but then there's also another one that probably most have not heard about, so we'll get into that later. But we'll start off with the Bell Witch. Yep. So this story starts with a man named John Bell, who was born in Halifax, North Carolina in 1750. And he decided to become a farmer... In 1782, he got married to Lucy Williams. And now Lucy, she was 20 years younger than John Bell was. So at the time, John Bell would have been 32 years old, and that would have made her 12. Yep. Which is pretty creepy. Well, I think that's what... That's what was normal back then. I mean, I guess it was normal back then, but now, I don't know, it just seems creepy. Yeah. If... the. Yeah. yeah if know. it was that way nowadays, it'd be super yeah. weird. But they uh, they had their first child, I guess, eight years later. Yep. Um, they had a son named Jesse. And the Bells were doing pretty good and well off on their farm in Edgecombe, North Carolina. They did end up having three more sons over the course of several years. And in 1801 they began having problems with their crops. So they decided to leave the farm and head west, and that's where they arrived in Red River, Tennessee, uh, which is now known as Adams, Tennessee. Which is about 45 minutes from Nashville. They also took Chloe, a lady that was given to them by Lucy's father when they got married, and Chloe's eight children... They were welcomed into the community. They bought a house and 21 acres, and it had a lot of barns on it and an orchard. Once established, they were pretty successful and prosperous in the area, and John became very well respected um, and wealthy, and one, I guess one of the wealthiest men in the area at the time. Um, as years passed, the family grew and they ended up giving birth to a daughter born in 1805 and her name was Elizabeth but I guess she had a nickname of Betsy or that's what they were calling her. Yeah and she later becomes the focus of this haunting. So after 13 years in Red River things took a weird turn. The first thing that happened was when John was out hunting one day and he sees something off in the woods he described it as this big creature that looked like a big black dog but then it had the head of a rabbit so he decided to shoot at it but he missed but now that's the the crazy thing though like if you see something like that um, you know and I talked about that in the previous episode before Um, a lot of people are going to think that you're crazy for seeing something like that. And half the time it's like people don't want to believe you, but I mean, it's probably possible that something like that is out there and, you know, we just don't see it often or it's some kind of like shapeshifters. Oh yeah. Something. Yeah. And I guess he wanted to shoot at it, so... I guess either to prove that it exists or to get it off of his farm. Yeah. 
Then one of their sons saw this huge bird creature sitting on a fence post. But he said he had never seen a bird that looked like that. So he also shot at it, but he missed that too. Then one day Betsy was walking in the woods and saw this little girl in a tree and she was wearing a green dress and she was just swinging in the tree and then I guess just, just vanished, vanished. disappeared. Like she wasn't even there. Like a ghost. Yeah. And I guess soon after, strange occurrences began happening more often within the home. Tapping and scratching on the walls and doors. And they looked around but couldn't figure out where these sounds were coming from. Yeah, and a lot of their slaves around the land would see a big black dog. But whenever they would try to get closer, it would just disappear. I guess over the time, as the sounds grew louder in the home, um, they began to hear like a faint voice. And though they couldn't really make out what the voice was saying, I don't know if it was muffled or, or whatever it was, um, they described it to sound like an older woman. The Bell's children's bedding started being pulled off of them at night when they went to bed, and they started hearing what sounded like rats gnawing on their bedpost. But when they went and got up and lit a candle and went to check to see you know, if it's rats or whatever it was, there was nothing there and there was no sign of any damage or anything on their bedpost. Just sounds. And they would start to hear dogs fighting in the house and chains dragging across the floor, but again, nothing was ever there. And they would also hear like lip smacking noises and gulping sounds. <laughs> Gulp. Yeah. I mean, that's an odd sound, like. Yeah. Of anything else. What if you're just smacking? laying in bed and you're just like. I don't know what I would <laughs> make of that. I don't know. I don't know how they stayed here that long. <laughs> well, yeah, that's another thing, too. I mean, I'd, I'd be done. See ya. Yeah. William, one of their sons, said that something lifted him off his bed by his hair one night. And while all this is going on, all this craziness that's happening, John Bell started developing like a medical issue, and his condition worsened as time went on. Um, it, he said that it felt like his tongue was stiff and he couldn't eat, like he had a stick lodged between his cheeks and it wouldn't allow him to eat, and any time that he tried to eat, the food would just fall back out of his mouth. And I guess Betsy was the only one that could actually hear the voices, like, clearly. And the voice told her that she doesn't need to marry her fiancé, Joshua Gardner. She would also get slapped in the face, her hair would be pulled. And all this torment that's going on in this home makes you wonder why they didn't leave the farm. And I mean, I know people get into that like situation where they can't leave their home because they have nowhere to go, but if you're being like tortured that much or whatever, you know, there's a breaking point and it makes you wonder why they stayed there. Yeah. And then at first, John wanted to keep these hauntings a secret from the community he probably didn't want to feel crazy. Yeah. But eventually they got so bad, he ended up telling one of his friends, John Johnson. And he had him and his wife come out to stay a night at their house so that they could see... I guess what was going on. For themselves, on. Yeah. yeah. And um, I guess they were hoping to help and figure out what was going on, but... Only, you know, to experience the same phenomenon that was happening that the Bells were witnessing. Um. Yeah, so they came over to stay the night, and they did. They heard all the noises. They had their hair pulled. Yep. They had their covers pulled off them at night. 
everything. And then Johnson thought that he could possibly speak with this mysterious voice. He determined that it was smart. And I guess over time, more and more people were coming to the bell house to visit and investigate the haunting. The spirit began calling itself by the name of Kate. And she began manifesting herself stronger. And she was quoting Bible verses and songs. So Kate is one of their neighbors that hated John Bell. And then when the spirit was asked what it was, it said it was a spirit that was very happy, but it had been disturbed. She said she was buried nearby, but her grave had been disturbed and one of her teeth was under the Bell's home and she was looking for it. So I bet it got disturbed by them plowing their fields and stuff. Yeah. And who knows how her tooth got under the house. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. I mean, I, I don't know. So this became so popular that Andrew Jackson even heard. And he came to the house to see for himself. And when he pulled into the driveway, the carriage stopped. And he said that it must be the spirit that was stopping it. They were planning on staying about a week there, but they left after just one night because they couldn't take it because the hauntings were so bad. See, if somebody can't take one night, but then you got these people that are just like living through it, it's just yeah. crazy. They're like, oh, it's normal now. But I mean, we got some stories about a house that we lived in. Um, but we'll... We'll get into that later. Yep. So after that, things shifted to being more sinister. When a family friend stayed at the house, he heard the voice say it wanted to get in bed with him. And then he saw the shape of a body under the covers right next to him. So he jumped up and grabbed it, thinking he grabbed the witch and threw it in the fire, but no one was there. And then later on, Lucy ended up getting sick, but they said that the spirit was actually being nice and seemed to be taking care of her and would sing to her. Betsy would start having feelings of being pricked by pins and being slapped in the face so bad that she would have red whelps on her face and her shoes would be pulled off and then the activity on Betsy slowly stopped but as soon as it did I guess wasn't it John Bell's health started declining yeah his tongue would stiffen and his face would go into these spasms and over time would get more frequent and worse. Then he would get assaulted like Betsy would by being slapped and his shoes would be pulled off when he was walking through the fields. And then in December 1820, John couldn't be woken up from his sleep. And they found a vial of fluid next to him that had like a dark liquid in it. Like he was poisoned. Yep. A doctor was called in, and the spirit said he would never rise from his bed again. And he died on December 20th. After his death, the activity pretty much stopped, but kind of continued until 1821. But sometime in 1821, she told Lucy that she would return in seven years. And she did. She appeared again in 1828. And she would do the same thing. She would pull covers off. She would tap around the house. Pull their hair. Pull their hair. Um, now that went on, but it only went on for two weeks. And yeah. And she vanished. They decided to just ignore it, and it worked. She left. It makes you wonder, like, why did they just didn't ignore it before? I don't know. 
I mean, if that would have done it, I don't know. They if it were probably done so it. used to it when like, it came oh, back. It was like, oh my gosh, not this again. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. I'm used to it. So that's pretty much the story of the Bell Witch. Um, there's a lot of theories about this haunting, like someone wanted to break up Betsy Bell and her fiance, Josh Gardner. Which they did break up because Betsy was so scared of the spirit. Another theory is that the two boys and Betsy learned ventriloquism on a trip and they got together and I guess decided to do this prank, you know. But there were things of this haunting that the boys were away and. They were in the same room when. They heard the like voices. Yeah. yeah. And how would they... That's just not possible for them to go around and pull everyone's hair and... Right, when it's coming out of nowhere and getting slapped in the face. And not be seen. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, I mean, that kind of rules that out. Yeah. For sure. And then there's, like, theories, well, they just wanted attention. But... Like the family wanting attention from, like, the town? Yeah, but to do it for like years and years and years but for what yeah i mean sympathy or (laughs) and there was also no record of andrew jackson ever going there there's no witnesses there's no journal entries in his journal i mean that's interesting if because he kept journals so if he did something like that going to a haunted house, it would be in his journal. Right. And then there was the rumors of Kate Batts haunting them because of a bad business deal. Yeah. And everyone thought she was a witch because she was odd and she was loud and annoying. So I guess there's a lot of people that don't think it's true. The only thing I wonder about, especially with the Bell Witch, um, in the early years, and I don't know if it changed over time, but where did the cave come from? Because there's the yeah, there's the a Bell Witch cave. the Bell Witch cave that you can tour, and nothing in the story mentions a cave. But there have been stories like later on, like if you go and you tour it and you and, drink from the water, or they, take a rock, you'll be like haunted. Yeah. Like, your pipes will bust, and... Yeah. So, I don't... I don't know. Uh, we haven't toured it. Um, it might be something fun to do. One yeah. Day. I'm going to take a rock. See yeah. what happens. Now, Adams, Tennessee is only, like, what? Like, it's an hour? 45 minutes from here. Yeah, so... From Nashville, so... Uh, if you ever visit Nashville, you want to check it out. It's not too far. Yep. I don't know where the cave comes in, but... I mean, you can go check it out. Yeah, you can still check it out. So you had another story about a witch. A supposed witch. Um, Hold on. Okay, so this story is about Sadie Baker. Um, It begins sometime in the 1800s in Manchester, and that's about an hour or so from Nashville. And this involves the Shelton family, and they lived in the area for many years, and they're pretty well known, and they were said to have had several beautiful daughters and strong sons. And Olivia uh, supposedly was like one of their, you know, very beautiful daughters that they had, mm-hmm. and she had long black hair and sapphire eyes. What's sapphire? I'm not sure. Purple. Maybe. Sapphire. Green. Um, Blue. Red. Oh. I don't know. So Uh, she was a witch. Somebody let us know what sapphire is. Uh, Okay. She was shy, um, but she had a very kind demeanor. Um, Apparently she had quite a few men that was interested in her. And one day on her way home, she came across this young woman that was wearing like this dusty cloak Hmm. yeah (laughs) Uh, yeah it was dusty she was dirty (laughs) 
she was hunched over on the ground, and I guess she was just looking for change like a hobo. And Olivia had never seen this woman before. This sounds like a princess story like Disney. It, it could be. So Olivia walks over, you know, wondering, you know, where this woman came from and who she was, and she kneeled down next to her. And she could smell that this woman had not bathed in a while. Ew. She was dirty. Smells like you. Yeah. (laughs) So. (laughs) Olivia figured she was probably tired and hungry and asked if the woman wanted to come back. And they would clean her up and give her some food, you know, and a place to sleep. That's nice. Yeah. Um, you know, but the woman didn't respond. She didn't say anything. So Olivia just figures, okay, well, you're going to come back with me. We're going to sort all this out. We're going to get you food, get you cleaned up, and you can have a place to stay, you know. Mm-hmm. So the woman followed her home, and her mother and sisters began helping by cleaning her up. Um, once when they removed that dirty, nasty cloak off of her, they saw how beautiful this woman was. And she had blonde hair and jade eyes. Again. Jade is green. Okay. I wasn't sure that time. I think sapphire is blue. Yeah, that's probably, yeah. (laughs) While she was only in her early 20s, her frame was so, like, small that she could fit into Olivia's clothes. Mm. The other sisters were becoming very jealous and, you know, they were wondering who this woman was and why she was here um, and why she never talks. When Olivia's father and brothers got home from work mm-hmm. that night, mm-hmm. Mr. Shelton, mm-hmm. he went to his wife and was, you know, talking to her and said that he didn't believe that it was a good idea for this woman to be in their house, you know, among all these their beautiful daughters, you know, because he was worried that the men that were interested in his daughters are now going to be interested in this mysterious woman Uh and it wasn't going to be you know fair to his daughters um that there's this woman that's prettier than his own daughters yeah but you know mrs shelton said that if they were to turn her out into the streets that somebody you know like a neighbor down the road is just going to welcome her in so it's not like they would really be getting rid of her. Um, so she said the best thing to do is to hide the woman inside their house until all of their own daughters got married first, and then they'll let the woman go. What? Yeah. That's weird. So basically she's being held hostage. Yeah. Uh, so Mrs. Shelton told her children not to speak to anyone about this woman And they told the woman that she was only safe if she remained indoors and never went outside for any reason. But a few days later, Olivia, I guess, grew confidence in her own self that she invited this strange woman to go to the store with her. And it didn't take long for the townspeople to notice this woman and word, you know, spreaded like wildfire. The very next day, a young man that was originally interested in Olivia shows up at the Shelton's house, knocks on the door, but now he's interested in this mysterious woman. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. So, um, the Shelton's, you know, Mr. Shelton, Mrs. Shelton said that they had to talk to that woman's family before they could, I guess except the marriage proposal that he was offering. Well, Olivia's, like, standing by, you know, kind of hid in the corner, you know, listening. She's getting upset. So she goes to her mom and says, you got to do whatever is necessary to get this woman out of the town. But Mrs. Shelton had, like, a plan of her own, Mm -hmm. right? Right. So the next day, she went to their preacher and said that this woman must be a witch... She explained how she appeared in the town out of nowhere, and she bewitched everyone to see her as the most beautiful person in that town. Oh, my gosh. Right. And the woman would not speak, 
she ended up convincing this preacher, you know, I guess that she, you know, this woman can speak or anything that, um, because of that, that if she were to speak, that only evil would come out, right? So this preacher, I guess, is believing that, you know, this woman's now a witch. Of course. So the townspeople gathered up, and they decided that something had to be done. And they debated, you know, what they were going to do to her, whether they were going to burn her, hang her, or drown her. Wow. Yeah. So they didn't know her powers, though, right? Because she's a witch, she has some kind of powers, and they didn't know which way to kill her. So they decided that the safest bet was to bury her alive. Wow. So moments after the meeting, people gathered up outside of Shelton's home, and they dragged the woman out. She did not speak at all. The men bound her hands up with rope and tied it to a long rod in which they were dragging her to the cemetery where people were already starting to dig her grave. And along the way, men were like shoving her, women were spitting on her. And while awaiting her death at the cemetery, she was staring at Olivia, who was crying at the cruelty which was being done to this woman. And the only thing that the woman said, like before being buried, like right before, was, I am Sadie Baker. Whoa. Now, a few months went by after Sadie's execution, and Olivia got married, but during the marriage, Olivia began to start going crazy, right? Right. She was staring at herself in the mirror. She was hating her dark hair and complexion. Oh. She said, let's see. It said that she would stare at herself for long periods of time, right? Mm -hmm. And she would stare at herself so long that instead of seeing her own face in the mirror, in the mirror that she would see Sadie's face. Oh gosh. So her husband kept trying and trying to get Olivia to stop, you know, and begged her to quit staring into the mirror. Then one day her husband came home to find Olivia pulling clumps of her hair out, mm. you know, saying that they did not belong amongst her pale locks. And then so horrified by his wife's behavior, he now goes to the preacher and he explains, you know, what was going on with Olivia, saying that Sadie Baker must have bewitched Olivia mm -hmm. to embody herself. So in order to destroy the witch inside Olivia, they began, like, they began doing several treatments, but nothing worked. One night, Olivia ran outside screaming, I am Sadie Baker, I am Sadie Baker. And her husband, like, ran after her, caught her, pinned her down to the ground. But it was said that she had the strength of, like, ten men, and she tossed her husband off of her and was, like, laughing, you know, dev devilishly and what the just heck? running around all crazy. And then she just took off into the woods. And, you know, the townspeople got out, was searching for her, but she was never seen again. That's crazy. Pretty crazy. I wonder if she was, like, possessed by her. It's possible. Huh. That's crazy. Well, that'll do it for tonight's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, a couple of witch stories. Um, we are also going to be working on um, one of our own stories uh, about a haunted house that we lived in. So if you guys want to check that out, just make sure to watch out for it. You know, yeah. sorry that we were kind of late putting this one up, but you know, like we said, work kind of got ahead of us and our schedule got all crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to try to keep it weekly as much as possible and try to get ahead of it and, you know, really focus on getting, you know, one episode up a week. So we're going to like move on to the paranormal yes. ghosty stuff ghosty next stuff. week yes spookies we got a crazy story yeah uh we also um we're gonna try to get a guest involved in this yep. next one so she was involved in this crazy yeah so as we, story if, of ours 
if we can get her over here uh, to put you know her her story on it too, uh, we're gonna try to do that. Yeah. But um, we appreciate you guys. Good night.